every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m., The Anglican Voice is on I-95.5 FM. Join us as we discuss topics and events involving the Anglican community and the Anglican Church in the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago. The Anglican Voice, every Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. on I-95.5 FM. Good evening, Trinidad and Tobago, and welcome to this edition of The Anglican Voice where we are airing on a special time as we on the Anglican Voice are also recognizing the need for a little bit of change during this period of time during the state of emergency. Good evening to, special good evening to my co-host, the dynamic Dr. Phaedra Pierre. Good evening, Phaedra, how are you? Good evening, Mark. I am very well, thank God. Um, yes. Hope you are as well and keeping safe along with all of our listeners. I am. I, you know, some people have the concept that being essential means is a privilege. And I too would love to have the opportunity to be at home and relax as well, but we all have to do what we have to do. And I thank God, Dr. Pierre, for the opportunity to have a job and still be able to go out and serve the people so you know so this evening we have a, a tight program with an extremely special guest but before we introduce our guests I would like Dr. Pierre Phaedra if you can bless us with a prayer to open up this evening's program all right let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we continue through this season of Pentecost and recognize the power and the work of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you will continue to guide us. We ask for your watchful eyes over the land of Trinidad and Tobago. Because, Lord, you know that Trinidad and the rest of the world is trying, we are trying to get a hold on this coronavirus. We pray for your guidance and we know that your Holy Spirit provides that kind of guidance to show us the way, to light our path, to enliven us to do the things that need to be done. And so, Lord, we put all things into your hands and we pray that we will continue to yield to your will and walk in your ways all the days of our lives. Amen. Amen. And... We ask you, as we open with our first hymn, so we ask you to stay tuned with us as we will be right back after this.
So thank you for staying with us. I hope that you enjoyed that hymn and uh, that you are really moved as we, you know, celebrate the season of Pentecost. Yes. As Bob mentioned, we have a very special guest with us this evening, and that is our own diocesan bishop, the yes. right Reverend Claude Berkeley. Good evening, Bishop Claude. Good evening, <laughs> Dr. Phaedra and Lay Minister Mark, <laughs> Lay Minister Plenipotentiary. <laughs> <laughs> Bishop, I should have expected that, so that's okay. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good evening, Bishop, and welcome to the Anglican Voice. It's been a while since we have had your voice on the program. Pleasure to have you. Thank you for your warm welcome. Yes, so Bishop. Today is a huge day in the life of the Christian community. Today, well, yesterday, but we're still celebrating it today as well, and we continue to celebrate it every day, Pentecost. Can you tell our listeners what is Pentecost and why we are so excited about it? Okay. Thank you for the question. Now, yes. Pentecost... 50 days after Easter is uh, marks rather the outpouring of the spirit of the church. I say the church as the extension of the original and primitive community because we will treat the disciples and their followers as the fledgling church. Jesus asked them to go back to Galilee and to wait there. And he would come to them. Now, we are going in, in sequence. It's the resurrection. It's the pre-resurrection uh, last discourse then the crucifixion and death and so forth and all the teachings that happened before that then we come to the resurrection and resurrection and ascension i made some pains the last time to point out that the resurrection and ascension are really two sides of a same coin we tr we have the church has separated them because it wanted to give them due care and attention and not want one to subsume the other. And what has happened is that we use, I think the Acts uh, explanation of 40 days, which is like the fullness of a, of a, of a revelation, fullness of a time of a revelation and use that 40 days to mark the ascension. It's mentioned in the Acts chapter one, and that has been the traditional reckoning of it. So that we can pay attention to the fact that the mission is complete. Okay, so we had the resurrection, that, that, that first part of the miracle, Jesus was brought again from the dead. All those who presumed that they had snuffed out the, the mission and purpose and that they had gotten rid of that nuisance were stunned by the fact that God has the last say. The resurrection marks that. And in so doing, we say death and the grave were destroyed. They were vanquished. But there is a second part. The second part has to do with the completion of the mission and purpose. Jesus came among us. He came and he did his work. He was carrying out the course of salvation. And he had completed that earthly undertaking. And now he was going back to the source. 
from whence he had come. And that is significant because it gives us a template. Obedient servant, having done our duty, we return to the Father. But not just returning to the Father, returning to the Father to sit at the right hand, the right hand connoting the place of power, there to intercede for us, there to continue to do our role to reconcile us to God, to bring us back into right relationship with God. That is a different phase of the process and is marked by the ascension. Rejoice the Lord is King, or Lord and King adore. And that's one of our hymns. And you, you, that is giving a celebration for that aspect of it. If we had the one and done thing, the, the, the idea is that aspect of completing your, the mission, returning to God, occupying a seat of power, continuing to carry us to, uh, to, to work the process of reconciliation with God, that could get subsumed and, and lost. And so we are down to Pentecost because Jesus promised that I will go back to the Father. But when I go back to the Father, I'm going to send a comforter. And that comforter, the traditional language, it talks about the comforter as a paraclete, which comforter is just one of the expressions of one of the facets of describing the paraclete, also described as intercessor, advocate, comforter, helper, and all of that. So you get the picture that we got more than we bargained for. Jesus was going back. We are sad. It is, we didn't want him to go back because he had transformed life so much. But he's going back to send us something more. Uh, one theologian says, Jesus was limited by taking on human form. But now this spirit, this paraclete, this comforter could be with different sets of people, different times, anywhere, anyhow, working the power of God, empowering people, pushing them to transformation, committing and convicting them to the way of Christ and the Lord and that kind of thing. So it is, it, it's very exciting because we've gotten that which we probably couldn't envisage. And so it is a time of focus, a time to remind us to, of what we have and what we have been given, what is available to us, and to give us a scope again of how much we can accomplish by virtue of this movement of God and God's time. With the, with the presence of the pandemic at this point in time, and we know the church, the present, we know the importance and the significance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. How would you say this or would point us into the end with the present pandemic that we are presently going through? Yes. Well, you see, again, that, that is, that's the marvelous thing. Uh, the picture of Jesus is going off to, going back to the Father went back from whence he came, that is a point of sadness. The picture of his death and all that went before, that is, again, a time of sadness. But every succeeding time of sadness is, is matched or surpassed by a time of rejoicing and celebration. And so this... Pentecost, which is in its original sense, a time of harvest. It is, it is, it is, it is a harvest, it's a harvest time. And it was a, a significant time in the religious calendar of, of those who kept it, the, 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 the Jewish calendar and so forth. But here we have, what are we going to reap here now? What are we gathering at this Pentecost time? We are gathering the gift of the Spirit. 
which will empower us, strengthen us, enable us to do extraordinary things. And it is it, at this point in time, it speaks to us about the struggle we are going through in a pandemic. In other words, God, it is a time where I said something earlier about, it's a reminder, it's a point of focus. So listen, we are panicking and we are afraid and a number of people are really going to have some mental health or nervous uh, reactions because of what the, the figures, the deaths, the, the sometimes what seems unexplainable. But here we, the, the, the church offers, the scriptures promote the gift of the spirit, that which is an enabler, that which is a comforter, that which is a helper to help us in time of difficulty and struggle. And we ought to use that to renew our energies to fight this uh, pandemic. Now we know how to fight it in the strict sense that distance, mask, clean hands, and so forth. Now vaccines are coming. Make up your mind to take your vaccine and see how we will pull out of it together. But it is timely, and I want to commend the Prime Minister and his team who have called a, um, a day of prayer on such a an high day, a high day, a time of a reminder that God has not forsaken you, that Jesus has kept his promise. I will send to you a paraclete, the paraclete, which is a comforter, an advocate, an intercessor, a helper, and that kind of thing. And that should give us a sense of uh, new energy, let's say, to continue to, 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 to battle to wage the war that is going to save our lives and our relatives and our country and to keep going. So I, I think it's timely and I think there's a, there, there, there's a match in it. Okay, thank you, Bishop. Um, you know, yes, we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, but I've found that sometimes the, the image out there, the general image of the Anglican church is not a very Holy Spirit church. What, do, you, do you agree? Do you, or how, how, how could we counter that, that, that image, that reputation out there that we are not really a Holy Spirit Church, you know, it's sometimes you think about the Holy Spirit Church and, you know, it has to do with um, speaking in tongues and um, being on fire and, uh, and Anglicans sometimes, uh, I think, get scared about um, the Holy Spirit. How do we counteract that as much as we talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we acknowledge the importance of the Trinity of the God, and yet still sometimes we shy away from the Holy Spirit part. I'm not sure if there's a shying away. I think it's a matter of language and, and how uh, religious language is a very technical kind of language. And uh, sometimes people think if you haven't spoken about it, that means you have not acknowledged it. And I don't think that is so. Uh, what, has, what happens is that we would like to divide up the Godhead in, 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 in three, but, but it's one God. It's, 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 in other words, where the Spirit is, the Son is and the Father remains so that we can't cut them up and put them in different places. Because, for example, in the passage for the gospel for this uh, Sunday, is where it, it says, 
you have come to testify on my behalf. The, 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 the Spirit will testify to you on my behalf. The Spirit causes Jesus to be known, recognized, acknowledged, and for us to submit, be sub, to submit ourselves to him. So that if we didn't say Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, that doesn't mean that we are not, um, and I don't, uh, I don't acknowledge that we, we, we have ignored the Holy Spirit. But maybe there's a point in what you're saying because if we were to package it differently, would we get a different result? So for example, and, and I might be preempting some of what you planning to ask me. The Holy Spirit has been guiding our church certainly long before I came. And since I have come, I have seen what the Holy Spirit has been charting for us. Let me give a, a quick example. Numbers are declined. We got the census and we began to look at it and we began to plan a program to examine uh, declining num membership. Then somebody says to us, listen, man, this is too negative declining. Why not talk about growing congregations? And we, we, we did that. We collected a whole host of um, suggestions, proposals as to what we might do or what we, how we could respond to this situation in which we were. That's 2011, 2012. And following on from there, we started the Bible study series and we, we didn't cast lots, but the Holy Spirit led us to Nehemiah. Going to build a wall, going to rebuild a wall. And as soon as Nehemiah comes up, he stands up for me all the time. As soon as you, you have a good plan, look out. Sanballat is present. Gisham the Arab is present. And Tobiah, the Ammonite, they're present. Opposition to anything that you intend to do. That was stark. Yet still, a few chapters down the road later, so we built the wall. In spite of the opposition, in spite of Sanballat's and other, and, and other persons. The question is then, so the Spirit has been guiding us. And we did this Bible study, we did Joseph, we did and so forth, and we came up. But you, you, that's what I'm saying, you may have more than a point, even if I have not acknowledged and accepted, you, have, you may have more than a point, and it's something that we have to look at. Because after we did that, we began to we put in place what is called a visitation program then some people still planning for the visitation program, right? It's about 2016, that's fine. And then out of the visitation program, before we could wink, we were led into a, 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 a diocesan strategic plan. And the conversion of the original idea of New Wine Vineyard into New Wine Vineyard, revealing Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is our mission, that's our vision statement in this diocese. So that's why I'm saying, how you mean we're not, we're not talking Holy Spirit? How are we not Holy Spirit? But what I'm saying is, you're right. Maybe the packaging, the wording, the phrasing is not in place or is not, is not appealing to people, but it's there, the Spirit is leading. And that's why this year in my own charge, I said, I asked him, open the eyes of our faith Open the eyes of our faith, Lord. Open it so that we could see the Spirit is leading us. So we came through the, the, the strategic plan. 
And then we say all kind of thing about the strategic plan, the planning, spiritual, and so on. Well, that was another story because we are spiritual beings by our baptism. <laughs> we became spiritual. A plan is spiritual. We, we take our spirit to whatever is there and we deal with it. It is just like what the, um, the, the invaders, the conquerors, the explorers did. They met a place and they Christianize it. They met a holy shrine that was something else and they, they bless it and make it Christian. I mean, we bring that spirit to what we are doing. People say, the plan is spiritual. This is spiritual. That book is spiritual. That client is spiritual. And so you're right. We may, have a, we may have a language dilemma in terms of how we discuss this thing. Sorry, but I might have gone off the, um, the question. You're crossing the all sorts of areas, Bishop. You started yeah. to turn on lights in different places. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it we could it, always it, follow up the interview if, 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 if it's a... <laughs> <laughs> and yes, Bishop, I agree. Now, you mentioned something there just now in terms of your journey. And it's also something that we would like to touch on this evening. Well, Bishop, sure. you know, um, it, it, it's, I know that a lot of our clergy today are um, balancing between ministry, ordained ministry, and secular work, which you have come through. What were some of the challenges in trying to be a teacher? Uh, a full-time teacher. I don't think you could be anything less than a full-time teacher. And, uh, and also carrying out uh, your spiritual ministry and leading um, parishes and that kind of stuff. Well, I don't, I don't know if there were... Well, let's stay with the word challenges for now. But let, 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 let me comment around it. I, I, I don't know if they were challenging. Part of what has happened is uh, something called formation. Now, when I say this, I think I, I've heard it being dismissed already, but I was brought up to serve the church. That is what was instilled into my head and psyche. As a little boy, before I could manage my own um, affairs, when I had to be just do as I was told, my vacation time would be disrupted to come back to the village to serve at, at some service that had come up while I was on vacation somewhere. I like to go to vacation to my grandmother who lived in Speyside because she was living right next to the recreation ground at the time. And there was always a group of boys ready to play whatever was the going sport. If it was football, if it was cricket, whatever. And then when you were done that, you went out to the bay, you had a good swim, and a good time was had by all until tomorrow morning. And you would be called back home, and I would always ask them, well, why are you calling me back home? Look, um, so there are other servers. Why do I have to come back to do this? And I would quarrel, and I would rebel and object. But of course, I, that was all you could do quietly and somewhere uh, to the extent, because you would get yourself properly <laughs> if you if you if you were showing yourself to be rude or whatever else as the case might be, so that was instilled into me by my pe both parents and a godmother who I grew up under her hand. So the point about it is, when I had to do become a teacher and a, and, and a priest, and that happened quite what I will call again. You, you say we don't talk Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit's guidance, because it, it, it just wasn't planned. I had left teaching, that's what I taught. But that is not what happened, to go to study. So what has happened is, as I got back and I got, both things began to develop, or both, both things came together, I worked, I, would, I used to say I worked 48 hours, in 24 hours because 
I am surprised my health has not deteriorated, but further than it has, because I did both things and I was, I had the good fortune to be appreciated wherever I taught, the teachers and students re responded to me as a priest. And so when I thought that I had a parish waiting on me to go to, this was also my parish here, counseling, discussions, this and that, advice, all of it. So there, were, I was not a teacher and not a, and, 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 and I, I couldn't part it up. It, it wasn't parted up. I, I wasn't allowed to have that. So I can't say it was, um, I, I don't know that it was challenging except that yes, many times I it was very tired and I think I compromised my, my health tremendously by doing that. My, my stomach paid for, for a lot of that and that kind of thing. But I rather had quite an amount of energy to do this. And I did not feel as if it was a burden. So sometimes when I, as the bishop now, I know I'm not the, I, I, I can't hear some of what uh, complaints because those are not complaints. When there, there is a joy in serving the Lord, I might not have begun in that place, but I think my parents and my godmother, they instilled it into you. That is what is your duty to serve the Lord. So when my, I, I happened to get a car, I was a teacher, so I got a car to carry the, the children up to school and that and so. And when I broke the racham in one of those potholes, I was busy to go and get the money, get into your little savings to get the, the thing fixed. So next Sunday you could go and do services as a lay minister, two services every Sunday because my parish had eight congregations and I was my priest, Canon Grisette, Cyril Grisette, God, for blessed memory, God rest his soul. He was happy to have the help and I was happy, as happy to go and get it done. I, I didn't ask the church to buy back my rakam and my front end for me. I went, I got it. And I would say to you, well, I don't have money, but the Lord has never left me uh, floundering. The car, the old car worked 12 years. I had it worked as if it was a new car and it carried me up and down those places and so forth. So that um, I wouldn't, I didn't see it as a challenge. I, and again, I'm trying to answer your question. So it was a challenge, yes, that I couldn't do more because I am doing a dual kind of ministry. And I, I, I know I discovered it after it was a dual ministry because even when I taught the secondary school students, they would expect me to allow them to come and vent in my class. And when I said, no, listen, we got to begin. It's time for us to get class started. They said, but, but you are the priest. So if we can't vent in your class, who, whose class we will vent? In? And they, all the grievances that they came from, everybody, and so, so you have to find a way. You had to find a way. I said, okay, take, a few, take two more minutes. And then um, you, 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 go, you try to get the work going and so forth. And I must say, in the end, that's one of the glorious things of what has happened. I tend to have a very good relationship with so many of those students because they, 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 there was a way in which we could connect. Again, I might not have answered your question, but... Um... No, but it, it, I think it was a perfect answer, Bishop, yes. because, um, well, as, as I said, it, it is the reality of many of our priests that they do have secular jobs along with their ministry and we have to learn how to marry the two um, in order to um, not short change on either side. Um, could you talk a little bit about your years at Codrington and how you think that that continued your formation? Yes, well again, uh, Codrington was a very good experience, great experience. I, I, I would might just reduce 
<laughs> how good it was. <laughs> it was a great experience. We had a, a, a lovely body of students uh, from different islands and, and Caribbean countries. I was there with somebody from Belize, from Guyana, from the Bahamas. Well, the Jamaicans go to uh, the UTCWI, so we had no Jamaicans there. But I had a Vincentian there, somebody from Montserrat, somebody from Antigua. So there was a nice spread. And you got a good picture of the Caribbean landscape. Apart from that, our lecturers were very, um, very, very knowledgeable, very brilliant people. And most of them were the Caribbean people. And they, you know, it, it, it helped me to understand that we are as good as any set of other people anywhere because we have the, we have the people right here in the Caribbean. And uh, our own principal was kind of Noel uh, Titus. Noel Titus, he's Tobagonian and he, he has retired now as a Reverend Professor of History uh, of the University of the West Indies actually. And so they help to, to, to guide us along a certain path and to instill. But I found that what we had done here in those days, we did some tremendous work here, Canon Clark and the Diploma in Theology, and the Lay Ministers Guild. Because I, a lot of what I did at Codrington College was like labeling and packaging. In other words, I had encountered these, some of these matters before. And oh, I see now that is what that means. So you, you, you could better organize the information and appreciate how it can be utilized. And of course, I was going there as a trade school teacher. So I was thinking of it in those terms as well. How, the, how, can, how do you reproduce this information? What do you do to get more of it so that you can give more of it? And so it was a, it was, it was a top class experience. Very, very, very good. Bishop, one more question though. And I don't. I, I know we, we you can't see a blushing in the interview, but um, as a young man, you would have met Mrs. The future Mrs. Berkeley. Yeah. For the young men out there that are listening and maybe worried about becoming priests, how was that? How did that affect admiration? Because I know you probably at, at that point in time wasn't even for bishop. You were probably aiming for priests at the point in time. So, how did that affect your <laughs> your 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 your, con your 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 conquest of your dreams? <laughs> let me let let me let me advise you that my wife warned me about you all. <laughs> <laughs> now, what happened is what happened is that um, again, I would say that. God gave me that wife, Holy Spirit. You see, I, I maybe I don't use the right words, but I have always attributed her as a God-given gift to myself. Now, so when I got married to her, I was not a, um, I was a teacher. I was active in the church. I was a lay minister. As a matter of fact, I went to Canon Grisette and I said to him, Canon, I have taken a wife and I cannot come. Because he was always asking me, when you're going to Codrington, boy? When are you going to Codrington? So now that I was married, I, I, you know, I thought I had a big excuse that was very scriptural. <laughs> so I went to him now and I said, Canon, I have taken a wife and I cannot come. And what is amazing, he did not say a word. He just uh, remained as if I, he didn't, I didn't speak. And after a minute or two passed, then he started to chat about something else about the church and we went on and that just went out the window. Now, but what I, what is, what is, what I say God given is that I left her and two children, of course, with the support of my parents because we were living near to my parents and my uh, brother and sisters. And I went off to Barbados for three years 
And while she was upset about it, about having to be separated and having to take on all of what the household had to do, she supported me to the hilt. And as if for good measure, I left her again for a year and I went to England to do the master's program. And again, she was right there in full support. In fact, she herself said, um, I think you should go. After I had gotten the scholarship, I thought that I shouldn't, um, I shouldn't do it again and go away and leave them again. And she said, no, no, I know you've been thinking about that. I know you've been writing a lot of letters and trying to, uh, to get a scholarship for your family to go and all of that. It didn't work out. And now you have something, I think you should go. So I didn't know what to expect. Every now and again, uh, you have husband and wife conversations and you would hear, I was married to a priest, you know, I was married to a priest. So don't um, something and something and something. And of course that is to try to get me under some kind of uh, subjection. But outside of that, I cannot say, I cannot say truthfully that she has not given me more than 100% support in what we have vented. So it is really a God-given gift. When I check up all the sets of um, times that she could have run away. <laughs> I left her there and she stayed there holding things together, Wonderful. supporting me so that um, Maybe I, I don't show it or talk about it. Maybe it's like the Holy Spirit, but <laughs> she is a pillar of my life. Yes. And, and, and when, um, when we interviewed her a couple of weeks ago, um, I, you know, I pointed that out to her. I said, you know, we have to be so grateful that you share the bishop with us so generously. Um, yes. I mean, your, your duties as bishop, of course, take you all over Trinidad and Tobago, take you all over the Caribbean. Um, but even right here, when, you know, when we have whatever service, when we have all sorts of occasions, um, and, and she comes along sometimes and, and is supportive and everything, but she really shares you very liberally with, with the diocese. And we really have to be grateful to her yes. for that. What's the, for want of a better expression, the legacy that you want to leave as Bishop Claude when you decide that the Lord has used me enough. What is it that you are driven by? What is the passion that you have? Your mantra for, for if you may allow. Well, I, I, I'm going to say something that is probably unambitious. You see that matter of legacy? Mm. I, I don't subscribe to it in this arena, really. No said. Because uh, you could do some things and the next somebody else will come with some other ideas and probably just undo or I don't want to say undo maybe but just it just gets ignored and we just go ahead. But my commitment and, and, and passion to it is that I have made my contribution, that I have obeyed my parents and my godparents, that I was here, brought here to serve the church. And I have been able to serve. It is, has been very uh, varied in its, in its uh, returns and expressions and so forth, but that I have been able to serve. And I have said casually that even if I might not be able to enjoy it, that I will have a good Anglican funeral with good hymns <laughs> stung at my funeral. And there I would have gone out leaving an Anglican church behind. Because there's a problem that we have with some people. They love the church so much that they love it to death. 
as if it, it must die with me. Well, that cannot be the church of the Holy Spirit. That cannot be the church in which the Holy Spirit dwells. It has to be a church that is moving on and forward as it seeks to convict the world about its wicked ways, its sinful ways. It convicts the people about their duty to God and those things. So I would like to really know that I have, when I examine my, my mind, my conscience, that I have served my church to the fullest. I've given my all. I, I think that I am nearly there to saying that, but I, I think it would be arrogant and I would be entering into an area that is uh, improper because God has given us so much. You can't give, you can't measure in, in return, but that I have been able to serve the church and to serve and run it hard. So for example, I have a, my, my son-in-law is, is an officer of the law. He says, but I thought, I the policeman here. I, I, you see, you, you're running, you, Bishop, you're running hard, you're running too hard. And he can't understand how, how it works because he has never been able to see how, you no, know, maybe I overdo things or I, I don't work smart or whatever. I don't know if it, that is what it is, but I'm accustomed to working hard. I was brought up working hard for the church on behalf of the church. And that's what I do. So that's, that is what is my, 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 my passion, that I have made my contribution to the fullest way possible. And if I, am, if I have done that, and I, then I, I go out of the world a happy and fulfilled person that I have served my God sacrificially, so to speak. The future now we have seen Bishop within 10 years from 2011 to 2021. 10 years going forward, what are some of the things um, does Bishop Claude see happening in the Anglican Church? Well, some of what you have identified, I hope we could have our own studio, really. And in that studio, we could do our television slash radio programming. And in that way, we can reach uh, people and present a face that people could treat with. What has happened is that uh, when the Anglican Church came on the scene some time ago, and this analysis was given by uh, the, the current principal of Codrington College, Dr. Michael Clark, he said, you know, what made Anglicanism so appealing is that we came in at a point of need. There were education was the thing and we offered education and we packaged it in such a way and we have some quite outstanding people who um, carried it and carried it very well. So Anglican schools had a, a particular kind of appeal. What we have to do now, where we are now, is that we have to try to find what is the need that we can fill now in the, among the population? What kind of need can we fill? And as we drive at that need, that will give us a, a renewed kind of energy to you know, consolidate and reconstruct and reform the church. Now, the point about reforming the church and all that kind of language is not that language must not terrify people. We have to be treating with the, the, the age in which we live, bringing that conviction of the same spirit to the world as we know it and as it emerges from time to time. So that the way we were speak to our young people is that our young people don't want to be condemned 
They want to be listened to. They want to have conversation. And they would like to know, yes, that they did wrong or they're doing wrong, but not in a condemnatory fashion as perhaps we had it when we were growing up. Our, our time of growing up might have been a little more abrupt, a little more rough, a little more um, abrasive and hard. But we were able to respond to it because we were a different type of child in that era. Today, we have another kind of child, much more informed than, than sometimes half the people in any, in, a, in any particular group. They're informed. They, they know a number of things. They can, but they don't have the maturity of mind to help to sort it out. One of the things we need is to, to, to engage our young people in a way that can give them a certain kind of opening. Young people's minds are to be blown, so to speak. Uh, one of my lecturers at the training college used to say, to take the children from the known to the unknown. You, you, you've got to lead them there. Yes. And as you walk them along there, they, they find that you are like an angel. Wow, you helped me to discover that the error of this kind of approach or that kind of approach. And so I think what is my, at, at bottom now, I think is another burning need is the teaching ministry of the church. And, 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 and the COVID and all of this has brought us into a point of crystallization. When I say that, we now have the YouTube and all of that that we might have been hesitating to go to and also. And we can now prepare some formats where the teaching can be done. And as a matter of fact, as we upgrade our information, we can actually put it back and revise and, 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 and have, so you can go back to something and, 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 and at your own leisure, pleasure, listen, look, follow the references given and so forth and learn more and more about this faith which is seeking understanding. You have a faith already, you know. You understand already, you know. But you never done being in faith and understanding the faith. So that because God is that which we cannot uh, measure in any one uh, place. But as we emerge and as we, we, we become more, uh, let's say, conscious of the divine, that we are able to be guided to embrace that experience of being in relationship, right relationship with God. So I would trump the signal, the teaching ministry. That's one of the things I would like to see come to some kind of a, a firm shape, a nice little department that generates real material in, 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 in the way in which people can receive it. At, at, at the lowest level, at the medium level, at the more intellectual level. Thank you. Okay, thank you again, um, Bishop. I, and, and, and finally, because we are perilously close to our hour, um, could you just two words to our families? Because of course, families, as, as you mentioned just now, growing up 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, is very different to growing up in 2021. Um, and, and again, our, our families are seen as or and are the, the kind of you talked about the importance of your parents' influence and your godmother's influence on your formation and your getting into hearing that call for ministry. So what, what advice or word do you have for our families in the context of 2021? Well, I don't know if you, you heard that I was resisting this thing for some time. <laughs> But nevertheless, <laughs> what I would say that um, 
clearly what we when we say family today we have to be very careful what we mean by family this is one of the things that the church will have one of the radical changes the church will have to embrace what does family mean it means an assortment of relationships not in the unified systematic way that we might have had it when we were growing up and in those family units where the the, the traditional nuclear family still holds and carries its task we have to be patient we have to uh, try to listen and engage the children it's a different methodology in terms of relating with the children we've got to listen to them we've got to allow them to speak we've got to get them to trust us and then they will outline what their difficulties are certainly they don't want to be made out today and they don't want to to be castigated in front of everyone and all this, that kind of thing so they will keep the information and transfer it somewhere else but 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 this is a time at a place where patient endurance has to come into being we not into the era of licks and beatings anymore we have to find how we can encourage dialogue conversation with the children so that we can guide we can direct them and do that with some kind of consistency in the other arrangements where the families are not in the organized way in budget commerce that we uh, assume traditionally where there is a big brother or a big sister or two little children managing some other little children or and the neighbors casting an eye and so forth this is a, an opportunity for the church to now enter into that kind of scenario and to provide the love of god the mystery of angels giving a helping hand people never forget those things when you are able to minister to them and help them to make sense of the confusion that they might find themselves in but again that means we have to get up and come out of the church we have to be out in the community well right away now we can't do that given the uh, restrictions upon us but it is a different kind of engagement and it must be deliberate we have to have some training to to to, to enable us to do that but it, it, i think you're touching a very core point if we are able to make an impact at the level of the home then we can actually change the scope of the community when you, you today you are going to a home a family you are going to a family that is no, undoubtedly multi religious or with two or three atheists in it and a number of other combinations and you might find yourself feeling a stranger but we have to reorient our membership or evangelism or drive or engagement to suit the community that has emerged upon us okay thank you I, I hear that we are having family day this year yes family day is set for the 3rd of june christy as is usual we have the family day every corpus christi for the last 50 or so years bishop abdullah uh, uh, instituted that i don't know if there was anything before him i certainly know of it from his ministry and that has come forward all the time uh this time again it's on done virtually and it, we're planning to have it televised on the Thursday at 11 o'clock and then a range of uh, social media activity to excite the family of God uh, after this the service service is due to be from 11 to 12 and thereafter the social activity and other engagements of the regions will be some will be displayed and some might be a little competitive and uh, a package is in place and i think next sometime they're hoping the anglican voice will allow them to 
to, to expand a little more on the details. But I'm asking members of the church and the wider community to please note the date. It's Thursday, 3rd June, 2021. Corpus Christi Anglican Family Day. Thank you very much, Bishop. And we look forward to that. And we, Anglican Voice, as you know, we are operate in whichever way we are needed to get the information out and as quickly and as accurately as possible. And well, with this, we have reached our hour and time has passed so quickly. As usual. As usual. It would be remiss of us to once again say thank you, Bishop, for contribution in the church and in the community as well, because it's not limited to the Anglican Church, but your the lives you have impacted as a teacher, the lives you have impacted as a priest, as and even more so as bishop. And we like to say thank you, pray God's richest blessings upon you and health and strength, as you, as well as um, Mrs. Berkeley, Mrs. Dawn Berkeley, and your two lovely daughters, um, Fiona and Sophia, that God will richly bless all of you as you grow from strength to strength. And I would like to ask of you one more request, Bishop, is that you close us this evening with a word of prayer. Two requests, Mark, two requests. One, he has to come back. Yes, yes. That to the story. Yeah, he, I think we should, I think we, we for, for Valentine's Day, we missed the opportunity to have Mr. and Mrs. Burke, you know, but um, we can't let that. We can't let that out of the bag yet. We could have it during the year. Love is not just Valentine's Day. <laughs> I told you, my wife warned me about you. Dear. <laughs> <laughs> just before the prayer, I would like to encourage the uh, listening public to adhere to the guidelines, please. Yeah. The guidelines for the resisting the COVID pandemic, the mask wearing, the distance, the hand washing and all other things that apply. And please prepare yourselves to receive your vaccine so we can actually beat down this uh, virus under our feet and come back to some semblance at least of normalcy. Let us pray, almighty God, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us, that we may continually be given to good work, the work of seeking to serve you diligently by engaging your people and making a difference in their lives as we are powered by your Holy Spirit. As we celebrate this gift of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, give us a true sense and a deeper understanding of the power that you have made available to us and help us to use that power, not for our own selfish gain, but for the upliftment of your people and for the building of right relationships with you and with each other. And we ask your God that you continue to bless and keep us in your love and grace this evening and forevermore. Thank you from all of us. I'm Mark Haynes. And I'm Phaedra Pear. God richly bless you and keep you. Phaedra, have a good night. You too. Thank you very much and have a good night to all of our listeners. Every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m., the Anglican Voice is on I-95.5 FM. Join us as we discuss topics and events involving the Anglican community and the Anglican Church in the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago. The Anglican Voice, every Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. on I-95.5 FM.